So now that we found this direct way, let me give you a math explanation of a math demonstration of how that works. To make it concrete, I'm going to give you one particular input. And I will give you a simple impulse response. So again, the impulse response, this H of T, is what our system does when we hit it with a hammer. It's what we do when we, when we hit it with a impulse and we get a unit step as a response. And if you've got a high level already of working with this signals and system stuff, you can already tell a little bit about what your system is from this. You can say, if I give it an impulse and if what I get out is this step function, then the only way, the only kind of a system that would transfer an impulse into a step function out is a, can anyone tell me? Switch? No. No. What, how do you transfer an impulse into a step out? PWM. I'm looking for an integrator. So if you integrate an impulse, you get a step. So by telling you what this step impulse response is, I'm actually telling you what the system is, but that's fine. That, that, that's at a pretty high level. I, I wouldn't expect you to get it at, while you're learning the pieces. So now the question is to find, find the output. The input looks like this. The impulse response looks like this. Find the output. And now you know how to do it. You write down the formula for convolution. The integral of x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. And so first step is just to plug in your, your numbers. So x of tau, what is x of tau going to be? Um, John, Jonathan. Uh, X of tau, um, would it be e to the minus t u of t? Yeah, almost, yeah. except it's not t, it's going to be... Oh, tau. That's it. All right. And um, Aiden, what's, what's going to be my h of... T minus tau. Um, it'll be U of T minus tau. That's it. This just means take whatever your H is, wherever you see its input variable, replace it with T minus tau. And we get D tau. Okay. So this looks like a pretty awful kind of, uh, kind of integral because we've got this thing that looks weird. So we're going to use... Squire's rule here, which is really simple. It says, if you've got an integral, an integral, and if you've got U of T's and impulses and things like that, very first thing is to get rid of those U of T's. So we need a little side note here. And our side note is, what does U of T times U of T minus T What does it look like? <sighs> yeah, it looks kind of like that. No. So here tau is variable. Right, tau is variable, it's what you're integrating. And t is fixed. You don't know what it is, but it's fixed. So, um, so in order to do this, we really, we just need to choose what t is uh, and, and then hope we can, we can generalize it. So I'm going to let t equal 4. But really, you can set it to, to anything. And then, and now let's draw our, our two things. Let's draw our first part. Let's draw, let's draw this. So we've got u of tau, and that looks like I thought I was being clever doing it in brown. Right, 
remember that we're integrating with respect to tau. So everything is, all of our independent variables are tau. So that's our U of tau. That's our, this is our first part. And now let's do our second part. So we'll draw U of four minus tau. Okay, so Dom, does that start off, tell me what that looks like. Does that start off activated or does it start off not activated? If I go far enough, far enough to the left. If I say, if I select a tau of negative 50. I would say it starts off activated at a negative 50. Yeah, it does. And in fact, we can, you can see when it activates just by asking when is its argument zero. So when is its argument zero? Still dumb. When it hits zero. Well, when it hits zero, this will be u of four. When it hits zero. positive four. Yeah. That's it. And then it goes down to four. Okay. So this whole thing. When we multiply it piece by piece, we can see zero, it's zero here times one here, that's gonna be zero. These are zeros times ones, that's gonna be zero. Now all of a sudden at zero, we've got one times one. So at, at when, when tau is zero, both these pieces equal one, so it jumps up to one times one, which is one and it stays up to one all the way up until four. And then for values greater than four, this guy drops down to zero. So the product of the two will also drop down to zero. And so this bottom piece is what u of tau times u of t minus tau looks like when tau is four. Is everybody okay with me generalizing this instead of saying, what is it when t is equal to four? Let's just let it equal to any t. And now that four just disappears and becomes t. And similarly, this four disappears and it just becomes t. And now we found what this thing looks like. Thumbs up there? Yeah, except for one problem. Can anyone see some value of, of T that I could select, which causes this to be a problem? As I make T bigger and bigger, it goes out to the right. But what do you think, John? Uh, we've got too many Johns. What do you think, uh, John Argauer? Argauer. Arg John, tell me the right way. John Argauer? Anger. Anger. I'm sorry. Yep, it's all right. All right. Uh, what was the question again? What happens when t is less than zero? Does this thing, this picture is right for any t greater than zero, but when t is less than zero, does it flip and do we get a top hat looking thing shifting over to the left or what happens? Uh, wouldn't it still be canceled out by the u uh, tau, the step function being zero? Exactly. So in other words, what we drew up on our left side is true for any tau greater than zero, but if we've got a t, t for any t greater than zero, but if we've got t less than zero, our u of t still looks like the same, but now this u of t minus tau, if t is less than zero, that thing now looks like that, which when you multiply it by our non-changing u of tau will give us a zero everywhere. So we've got two different options for what this original thing looks like. It either looks like zero if t is less than zero, or it looks like this top hat thing if t is greater than zero. Okay. Sorry, I had a quick question. Sure. For the on the right half, 
the paint graph, could you, and the green graph, could you mark, like, say, sure. mark like T? Sure. Let's, let's let uh, T equal negative one. Then this would be at negative one, where we'd be graphing U of negative one minus tau. So, actually, never mind, I got it. Does that make sense? And then zero times one is zero, zero times zero is zero, one times zero is zero. There's no place vertically where we ever have anything that doesn't have at least one zero that's being multiplied together, so the output's always strictly zero. Now that we know that, uh, Preston, tell me, now that we've got this side note done, and by the way, you need to be able to do this side note on your own for the for tests and exams. How can we simplify this next step? And I'll start you off, I'll say, well, it depends if t is less than zero or if t is greater than zero. So let's say t is greater than zero. We're now, multi now this whole section here is zero outside this range of zero to t. So how can we modify this integral? Preston, you're on mute. I can't think of it right now. Okay, well what would happen if instead, instead of being zero outside this region, what would happen if it was one everywhere? You if it was one everywhere, you, this whole thing would just become a one. You'd be multiplying it by a one and you could just get rid of it, right? And to keep the and keep integrating it between negative infinity to positive infinity of just e to the minus tau and this just becomes a one, you get rid of it. So Preston, I'm gonna keep with you for a bit. It's not one everywhere. In certain areas, we're gonna be multiplying it by a zero. As tau changes, this becomes a zero anywhere except for this region of zero to one. And in that region, this becomes a one and you can ignore it. So what can we do to change the limits to reflect that? Uh, just make it zero to T. That's it. So we modify our limits to, to, from what it was to zero to T. And in that region, outside that region, this is zero. So there's no reason to integrate. We know it's gonna be zero. Inside that region, this becomes one, so it just goes away and we're left with e to the minus tau, d tau. Any questions on that? Okay, so Ben, how about for type t less than zero, what does the integral become? Uh, you got your, uh, I'm not hearing you. Yeah, there's something wrong with the mic. Connor, help him out. He's got it, it would just be zero, right? It's just gonna be zero because you got you're you're multiplying by zero, so it's not gonna go anywhere. All right, so now this is the hardest step going from what we had before to this. Once you got once you pass that, it's just it's just calc two. Any questions about that step? Yeah, Ben, I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing you. Um, so Charles, let's do the integral. What's, what's this top integral? What's e to the minus tau d tau? Charles. Uh, I'm not sure, sir. I'm still looking over that last part. Which part are you uh, concerned about? Uh, t greater than zero. Okay. Um, I'll do a quick diagram to show you what it is. We've got, and then I'll erase it because this is not such great board techniques. We've got this e to the minus tau times this function. And this function is, is something that is only non-zero in this region and then we're gonna multiply it by tau. 
So we're multiplying this function by this. Now, we could break this up. We have three regions here. So if we wanted to, we could break it up between negative infinity and zero of e to the minus tau times whatever this is between negative infinity and zero. And so Charles, what is this function between negative infinity and zero? Well, it only includes zero to t. Well, if, if we're integrating between negative infinity and zero, and then I'm gonna do another one that's between zero and t, and then I'm so gonna do another one. one. would just be zero. So the first one is gonna be times zero. And then the second one will be, what is this thing in that region? Just zero to t. And so what, yes. and so what is this value? What is this function anywhere one. between? It's just one. And then this last region between uh, t and positive infinity? Zero. It would be zero. And so we know that this goes to zero and we know that this goes to zero because integrating anything by zero gives it zero. And so we're only left with, with this. And that's what we wrote up there. Does that help? So the, you have from zero to t for that first integral, does it matter that anything over t, so we had the limit being t greater than zero, but we had the integral from zero to t, does it matter that we have zero for anything greater than t? Like, do we need to have a separate something for that? Since we know that all of t below zero is zero, we need to have a it's separate because, It's because our top, it's because what this whole thing looks like for t, for tau greater than t is zero, that's what lets us ignore what our integral is doing for tau greater than t. Here's, an, here's another way of, of, of saying the same thing. We want to integrate, in general, any function times this weird uh, u of tau, u of t minus tau d tau. So I don't know what this function looks like. I'm going to make it completely arbitrary and I'm going to have it extend everywhere. That's my, that's my original function. And now I'm going to multiply it by this, but we already know that in green over here, we already know that this looks like a, like this thing and it's versus tau and it's only non-zero between zero and t. So if I, I can multiply these two guys together and then take the integral, and when I'm multiplying them together, I'll find that this, because I'm multiplying this thing by zero, it's gotta peg it out at zero, it just has to be. And the only time that it does anything, this f of t is gonna be between the zero and t that when we multiply this by it allows to pass. Okay, thank you, sir. That makes a bit more sense. And so now we can, and so now we can, we can say that this whole thing, we only need to integrate it between zero and t, and we've picked up what multiplying by this does just by changing the limits of integration. I'm glad you stopped me. But now I'm going to ask my second question, which is now that we've transformed it from here to up here, what is that integral? So the integral is negative e to the negative tau? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you got it. So it's negative e to the negative tau, and we're going to evaluate that from tau varies between zero and t. And of course, the second one is just zero. So that's t greater than zero, and this is t less than zero. I know this is taking a lot of time, guys. This is it. This is the, the whole meat of the lecture. After we get this, it's all downhill. So that we can just plug in our numbers. We can just say, all right, that gives us e to the minus t minus e to the zero or zero, depending upon what our t values are. Um, let's see, Philip, what is, how can I simplify this guy? 
that from? So uh, the part on the right, um, mm -hmm. the E, you know, raised to zero is going to be one. That's right. So now it's just going to be one minus e to the minus t for t greater than zero, or it's going to be zero if our t is less than zero. Okay, here's a toughie. I can write this. Instead of having to write it in two different regions, I can write it in a single region if I want to. I would like to multiply this by something so that it doesn't change my argument. It's multiplying it by one if my time is greater than zero, or it forces this whole thing to zero if my t is less than zero. What could I multiply it by? Anyone? U of t. Yeah, so you got team. It. And so that's the answer. So now take a look at that for a second and let's go back to where we started on the other page. I just showed you how to use convolution to go directly through up here. But we could have solved this going down in this pathway too, using Laplace. Let's just, let's just try that. 